Is relying on the Book of Mormon a matter of feelings or facts? Next on the Ex-Mormon Files. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you coming and or watching and Hopefully enjoying the, the program with us. We have Sam Fredrickson all the way from Boise. Yeah, hello. Hey, thanks for coming, and I appreciate you making the trip and, and uh, sharing your story, and it's quite a fascinating one. I hope so. Yeah. I hope it turns out to be. Where were you born? What's your background a little bit? I was born in a little city called Kaiser. It's right outside of the, the state capital of Oregon, which is Salem. Oh. Um, and you could pretty much literally throw a rock and hit Salem from my house. So. Okay. You just kind of live on the, the suburbs Small there. Small city. And yeah. You, were your folks active members of the church? Oh, yeah. Yep. So my dad, I think from my earliest memories growing up was when he was a bishop. And he oh. was a bishop for a few years. So, yeah. you know, and, and then from there, we ended up moving to Boise. Oh, okay. um, where technically Meridian outside of Boise. With his work, I guess? Or well, something. actually, the complete opposite. So what's interesting is we moved there for my family. My entire family pretty much lives in the Boise area. Oh, I see. My father owned a business in Salem. Mm -hmm. And so when we moved, he would actually fly back to Salem every week for oh, four or five days. Yeah. So from a very early age, it was very installed into me how important family is that, sure. that my dad would go and do something like this yeah. and your mom was active of course yep, and... yep. they're both uh wonderfully active members and, mm -hmm. and still are to this day and work i in the temple like they this, work in the temple you? every week for like six hours it's huh. it's amazing yeah. they're really devoted to their faith okay now those well those callings i guess rotate yeah. or something in, in the temple and all but and your brothers and sisters what do you have uh... yeah so i've got two older brothers the oldest lives across the country and he has two wonderful little children um and a beautiful wife they're all active mm -hmm. um i have my closest brother to me who lives in boise me and him are the only two who still live in boise as oh. my parents have moved uh to washington oh. and he and i are the only two non-members um oh. he had been he had he decided to be out of the church um, even earlier than I did age-wise. He was probably out around 13 or 14, if even that. Wow. Um, and just mentally, you know, he would still go to church when he had to and, and stuff like that. But at a certain point, my parents said, okay, you don't have to go to Mutual when you're, you know, 15 or 16. I think it was as soon as he got his Eagle Scout. Too hard to be rebellious or too hard to fight against. The, yeah, yeah. At the, a certain point, you just say, Yeah. But you ended it. up taking seminary and yep. you were... Deacon, teacher, priest, yep. and all that stuff. I was ordained all, all the big three, yeah. and uh, I loved seminary. And even after, even after leaving the church, mentally checking out of the church, I still went to seminary. I loved my seminary teachers, and in general, I have a great love for like world religion and world mythology and stuff like that. And so I kind of near the end of my, my senior year, I kind of just treated it more like that. Like, tried to be objective and say, okay, let's just treat this as a world religion and, and learn what we can. just fits in somewhere. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, gosh, uh, what kind of happens to, to your thought process? <laughs> it, it, it's been a wild ride, yeah. for sure. I started having issues with the church, and they weren't really issues with the church so much as issues with myself. When I was... 13 or 14, um, I felt, especially because I grew up with, you know, uh, my dad was a bishop and my older brother, my oldest brother, Ben, he was a, a, and still is an excellent example of faith. And I always wanted a lot to live up to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I wanted it, you know, I wanted to be in it. I wanted to believe, I wanted to be a part of it. Um, and then when I was 14, I started just making some bad choices, you know, mm -hmm. and you get involved with girls and, and, and the internet Things age and everything. And stuff, yeah. yeah. And so I, it was really at that point that as I was a, a deacon, I was the president of the deacons quorum and it was like, it was the best. I was so thrilled. Yeah. I, I remember being so proud that that's who I was. And 
it gave me an identity, you know? Yeah. I even in my like sixth grade Spanish class, we got to choose Spanish names um, so for the teacher to call us by. And my name that I chose was Diacono, Deacon. which is Deacon. Yeah, because I was so passionate about who I was and what I was. And then as I grew older, and you know, especially around the time I became a teacher, for whatever reason, I did. I just, I wanted it, I wanted to believe, and I wanted to be all in, but I had a lot of different sin issues in my life. And, and then you don't feel worthy, right? Exactly. I mean, you feel guilty and like you're not measuring up. Exactly. And, and I, I had... You're judging yourself, for sure. Yep. I had just multiple times where I had to go and talk to the bishop and stuff like that. <laughs> and I don't know where the message came from, but this message came into my head that, you know, when you're looking at, at priesthood power and things like that, this idea that, like, the priesthood needs a pure conduit to, to move through. You know, you can't be a, a authentic priesthood holder right. if you're impure. And so I guess I must have taken that really to heart because what would happen is when I did have issues, either, you know, if me and my girlfriend made bad decisions or if, if yeah. I, I viewed pornography or anything like that, I always had this feeling of like, well... You've clogged up yeah, the pipeline. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'm in this little box and, and in two or three weeks, once I've proven that I'm worthy and that I'm good again, I can come out of the little box and I can go back to, to seeing Jesus, you know? And I would distinctly feel like I shouldn't pray. And if I pray, something bad would actually happen that I'd be so brazen to walk into the presence of God yeah. when I'm so sinful. And that is... And that's when you need him the most. Really, I know. Isn't I know. It? <laughs> it's entirely insane. It's, it's, well, it's not insane. That was the wrong word to use. But it's just wild how differently it is. You yeah. know, I just the other yeah. night... Your perspective. Right? Yeah. The other night I was just laying in bed and I was thinking of every bad thing I've ever done in my life, as I'm sure most of us do sometimes. And I just had the story of the prodigal son just run through my head and I just started crying. And, and... I'd never been able to take something like that really to heart yeah. and to say, no strings attached, I, here I am. I love you, know? you. I love you. I love you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Amazing. It's, it's beautiful. And so, anyway, I'm sorry. I get off track. No, that's fine. And I thought it was interesting, too. Your family went on different uh, historical, mm -hmm. Mormon historical trips. And yeah. The pageant, the new, yeah, the, the, the Hilkamore pageant. pageant. I so we've gone to Nauvoo. Uh, we went to, um, I think we went to Independence. Yeah. We and yeah, we've been to to the Hilkamore, upstate New York area. And I've always had a love for history, and so it was the same sort of thing. Even even when my faith wasn't in it, I just loved the history of it, and I I loved being a part of it. And that's really something, you know. Yesterday we went to Temple Square, and we had a wonderful tour by these wonderful sister miss missionaries. And I told them straight up, I said, I was a part of the church and I left the church, but it's culture. It's almost cultural at a point, you know? Oh, for sure. These are your people, this is yeah. your history, that sort right. of a thing. And so I loved all those, those trips. And, and really, it was around the time that I went on the Hill Camorra pageant. I was 17 or 18, and I had one last little bit of faith left I feel like I had one last little shred and I said I'm gonna just try to bury this and and into this fertile soil of upstate New York the birthplace of of all of this mm -hmm. and see if I can't get something to grow and <laughs> it didn't unfortunately um, and it wasn't very long after that that I was sitting so I was a priest at that point yeah. and I had just blessed the sacrament and I'm sitting and I'm looking out over the congregation, and I don't know whether it was a real, or not a real, but an audible voice, or if it was just my thoughts, who knows. But I just heard, it's not real. It's all fake. Mm. And it shook me. And it shook that last little bit of, not my last faith in, in Mormonism, because I actually still had a l weird little bit of faith in Mormonism yeah. after I left the church, yeah. but of me in Mormonism. That was the moment when I knew I couldn't do it anymore. And so I stayed up there until the deacons came back and they gave back the, and I stood up and I walked out. And you know, I'd go back for Mother's Day and, and things like that, well, but I never really went back. Over after that. Huh? Yeah, yeah. And then it was rough for a while. Yeah. <laughs> it was It was really hard, you know. Um, 
because that that had always been my thing is and it's hard oh, to yeah. talk to family and friends isn't it about about this kind of stuff it can Did be you yeah. do that? you know not really yeah. and what's I was always I, I mean they don't want to hear it <laughs> right but yeah. I I was always on the outside of the circle I felt so ever since I was 14 um, and I started having these issues I would I would go through phases of, of I'm going to go on a mission, I'm going to get mission worthy and, and all of this and that's who I want to be and then other phases where I didn't do anything for months at a time. And so honestly I really don't think it was too surprising to anyone. I think that, that for, you didn't go on a mission. Yeah, that I didn't go on a mission, that I, I wasn't going to church. For one thing, I left I stopped going to church right about the time that I graduated, is how I'm remembering it. Right. And so it would have been totally natural for people to say, oh, he probably went to college or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to slip out that way. But then especially within my family, it, I just think that they kind of knew already where I was headed. Yeah. And my parents are, are such wonderful people that they never tried to grab me and force me back in, oh, you know. They, well, I think it's neat that you are honest of you to be able to admit that it was really not, I always talk about the bad yeah. news and the good news, yeah. but it was really your own self that, yeah. and, and they do, and some critics of us who leave right. do say, well, you left because you wanted to sin and that, yeah. and maybe in that <laughs> case it was you, yeah. but you've come to learn more about the church mm -hmm. and more about what I call the good news. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so like I said, I mean, when I left the church, it wasn't even that I was necessarily done with the with church. Mormonism, yeah. I felt that Mormonism was done with me and that I, that we were suddenly incompatible yeah. in some way, but it didn't mean that I had anything less than respect for, yeah. and I still do have respect for, for, you know, sure. the people in my life, but I, I didn't think too badly of it, you know, yeah. and I distinctly remember thinking, and it's, it's just hilarious now, you know, if I leave the Mormon church, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm never going to go back to another church. Why would I? That, you know, why would someone leave one church but just to go to another true one? church? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Why yeah. would they leave this just to go to something else? Yeah. And so it really was an adjustment. It really was a time of, of me knowing deep in my bones that there was something more than just this world and just where we are right so a now. So faith in God for sure yeah. that you're able to carry I wouldn't this, even, yeah. yeah, I wouldn't even say a faith in God. I had just a faith in something. Oh. Who knows what it was. And I went through all of these crazy like experiences. I got really into, I mean, all I pretty much did with my life was take drugs and hang out with people and stuff. And it was during these experiences that I really did have these kinds of weird affirmations in a way. You know, and it, it just always makes me think about how you can do anything and God can and will use it for your good. You know, it, what did he do for well, you? Well, in some of, I mean, in some of these, these weird times, I just had a undeniable sense of, of a spiritual reality around me. And I think that that's what kept me going through the darkest times in my life, that, that stopped me from becoming an atheist or, or anything like that is I just, I just got these little messages. And so I went through for a year, year and a half, and I just did whatever I wanted. And I just said, I'm gonna be who I wanna be. You know, I'm, I've got no rules. I am who I am and no one can take that from me. And it just got worse and worse and worse. Yeah, and you know, you're right. People look at, at people who leave the church and say, you just wanted to sin and this and that. And you know what? In a way, that was true of myself. I just wanted to live without rules. I wanted to be my own person. And so after about a year of that, I had the worst day ever. Um, I had gone through, I had really dialed it up, and I had only, for the last six months of this time, I had only been sober for any amount of time in a day for maybe five days out of six months. And it was just wake up and, and smoke marijuana and drink and, and do all of that while you're high or, or drive while you're doing all of that mm. and go to work and on your lunch break, go hide in your truck and drink a little more. And it was just awful. It was terrible. And whenever I was sober, I had panic attacks. Just, oh. I just had to hide and in my room under my bed. probably fortunate not bad things happened. Huh? I am extremely fortunate. <laughs> I can look back 
a, a dozen times off the top of my head if I wanted to and just see every time that I really should have been in jail or worse yeah. and somehow I escaped it all. Um, Maybe God was watching over you. Huh? That's that. <laughs> it's my idea now. That's where I've kind of gotten to at this point. So tell us about this bad yeah. time. Yeah. Well, it just came to to the point where I had had two really serious relationships. They both had failed. I was alone in my room. It was one in the one in the morning or something like that, and I was just done. And I just said, you know what? Because I think that there's something different and something better than this whatever I'm in right now let's go there this this isn't working for me you know I've tried mm -hmm. my best I failed time after time after time and so I'm ready to move on exactly huh? exactly and so that was my plan and thankfully my roommates were having a huge raging party upstairs and I'm all, I've, I'm a bit of an introvert and so I wasn't gonna go up anyway but my brother happened to be at the party and I knew he was at the party and I, I didn't think about calling him or anything like that, but as I went out to the garage to just figure something out, my uh, roommate came in, and she had just come in for a smoke, and she saw me, and she just immediately knew something was very, very, very wrong. Mm. And she said, what's going on? What do you need? And I said, please go get my brother. I know he's here. Please go get him. And she went and got him, and I told him, Jake, you, I mean, he knew. He knew I was on doing drugs and stuff like that. And I just said, it's bad, and it's really bad. And you're hitting rock bottom. Huh? Yes, I'm at rock bottom. This is it. I'm literally on the floor. I can't go any farther down. And he just took me, and we went to my parents' house. I think they were on, like, a ward camp out. And, and we just <laughs> stayed there. This was back when they lived in, Mer er, in Meridian. And we just stayed there for a night, and in the morning... He called mom and dad and said, hey, you need to come home. Sam really needs you. And I told him, and, and that was the hardest thing, was just being honest. To mom and dad. To mom and dad. And I remember sitting under the stars and having this conversation with my parents and telling them all of the, the terrible things I had done and how I had lied to them. I mean, for, for six months now, they were having dinner every Sunday and they were having family gatherings and I was just not showing up. I, yeah. I just stayed at home because that's all I wanted to do. And I remember my mom said to me, I forgive you and I love you, but you're never going to do this to me again. That's, that's it. That's non-negotiable. You're never going to lie to me like this again. And I think I've kept that promise. We'll have to see. <laughs> but from there, we decided that I needed to go to a, a hospital and get treatment. And so I was able to get checked in the next day. I made all of these calls, one of which was to my wife. Or, well, she wasn't even my girlfriend at the time. She was just some wonderful, wonderful girl that I knew. And I called her and everyone else in my life, and I told them how sorry I was and how I had failed them and how I was going to go get help and I was going to be better. And I went to the hospital. And I was there for four days, four or five days. And it was really like... I don't know if you've ever read the book, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Um, I'm aware of yeah. that. Yeah, and you know, it's just about like these people in the hospital that are, are they're hanging out and they're, they have a little community. And that's really weirdly what we had. I mean, it's most people, the mental hospital is the worst place and, and rightfully so. And for me, from the moment I got there, I felt like this was right. I didn't want to be here, and it was scary, and I, was, I, I felt really alone. But from the moment I got there, all of these other primarily older, much older people kind of took me under, my, under their wing, and they, they you know, taught me how to roll my own cigarettes and things like that. Oh. It, was a, it was an awesome time, really, truly. Um, and in the hospital, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, and I realized, the doctor said, I don't think you're an alcoholic, and I don't think you're, you're addicted to any of these substances. I think that you're using this to cope, because you're... Because of the bi bipolar. Yeah, yeah, because of the bipolar, because you're having panic attacks every day. And so I got on some medication, and I was about ready to go home. There was a little bit of like working on myself that I wanted to do, but I had, I had mentioned to my doctor, okay, I think I'm ready. And they said, okay, let's take a day or two and see. So that was, I want to say, day three. And that afternoon, there was a gentleman in the hospital. His name was Jimmy. And 
he was huge. He was like six foot four or something crazy. An older gentleman? An older gentleman, yep. He had long, wispy silver hair. He had two teeth. He probably weighed about three to 350. He had he two was, teeth? He had two teeth right there. It was <laughs> okay. wild. Uh, and he, he was a street sweeper and a street cleaner. And he was told that he had to leave. His insurance had run out. No one was paying for this. He didn't have any money. He needs to go. Mm -hmm. And he flipped out. I mean, just, they, they, they had to give him a, a sedative, something very strong to knock him out because he just, he couldn't go. He just couldn't do it. He and was afraid to face the... To, to yeah. face the real world again. And so that evening, the evening of the third day, I'm sitting in the kind of common area and there's like a TV and there's craft supplies behind us. And there's this other fellow named Harrison and he had also grown up LDS. And we had both, at this point, left the faith. And we were watching this news report of some flood or some disaster that had happened. And I remember him saying, don't you just, doesn't it just make you think about those things that they would tell you in the church, that the end is here or that it's coming right around the corner, you know, and, and that this is the time and you have to be vigilant in this and that. And I said, Harrison, you can't really believe that, can you? And he just gestured up at the TV and he said, just look at that. Look at the world that we're in. And then he left, and so I just had to sit there with myself, thinking about thinking, this. Yeah. You know, think, uh, uh, a person recently diagnosed with bipolar disorder sitting in a mental hospital thinking about the end of the world. It's like <laughs> a stereotype, actually. But from there, I just decided I needed to, to just calm down for a little bit. And so I'm just drawing and coloring and stuff. They have like these beautiful mandalas. And it's about 11 p.m., Jimmy had been knocked out or taken a sedative around one, I believe. And so 10 hours later, he just shambles into the, to the common room and he just couldn't sleep after having been asleep all day. And so we sat and we talked and he just opened up. I didn't even want to know all of this stuff about Jimmy, but he just opened up and he told me about his life as a street cleaner. He told me about how there had been one time in his life when the devil had been on his back for a year. And he had prayed all day, every day for a year, and he just couldn't shake it. And finally something happened and it was gone. And he talked about how what he was going through now was as hard, if not harder than that. And wow. yeah, and we started talking and he said, he started saying things like, if there's, you know, I know there's a God. I know there's a God. I know he loves me. Why would he let this happen? Why would this happen to me? And I was in this precarious position of not really believing in, in God, you know, believing in something, but not really in God, but also not wanting to be the guy who's like, well, Jimmy, you yeah. know God's a, a, a myth, right? You know it's fake. And, you know, I didn't want to try to take that from him. And so we sat and we talked, and I kind of played the devil's advocate. I did like this kind of proto-apologist <laughs> style of just sitting there and trying to say, you know, well... Just listen to him. Yeah, and... just listen to him and try to respond as best as I could. Sam, by the way, I think we're going to have oh, to go okay. into a second uh, okay. thing because our time is zooming by and oh, there's wow. so much you have yet to share. Yeah. So let's, uh, just so you're aware of that. Okay. So we've got another couple of minutes. Okay. But I did want to back up and we'll, oh, yeah. and we'll talk about Jimmy again, okay? Okay. In the next one. But um, you, you mentioned you had this sense of God in your life. Mm -hmm. What was Jesus to you as a Mormon? How did you view him? I, I, I mean, I've, I viewed him as the church told me to view him. He was my older brother, and he loved me a whole lot. And I could, I could understand that paradigm. I mean, I had two, and still do have two older brothers who love me more than, you know, the world. And so it made sense to me, but... That he was our elder brother mm -hmm. in the spirit world. And, yeah. But he was distant, you know. He was, I, I didn't feel his presence at all. More about Heavenly Father, right? Yeah, you know, well. We pray to Heavenly Father. Yeah. And, yeah, but I didn't have personal encounters. You know, I didn't have personal experiences. I remember once praying to know if the, the Book of Mormon is true and having something happen in my chest. I don't know right. exactly what it was. It was actually quite painful. Oh. So who knows <laughs> there? Well, I, I had the burning in the bosom, yeah. I have to say. Yeah. But, but I was expecting to have the burning in the bosom too. Exactly. So, yeah. And so Jesus was real to me, 
but distant from me. He was somewhere very far away. And the Bible? And the Bible, I truly believed that they would be the same, that they would be reconcilable, because I went through the Bible and the Book of Mormon were yeah, you know, because I was preaching the same message, mm -hmm. so to speak. Because that's what I was always told. You know, people would come up to me and they'd say, you know, well, if one says one and the other says something different, what do you believe? And I'd say, well, that wouldn't happen. You know, they're all the Word of God. They're all the same. But yeah, and and I had a very strong testimony of the Book of Mormon, even when I was not living by its precepts. We talked about that a little bit earlier before we mm -hmm. started about being able to compartmentalize mm -hmm. because here you had this sense the church was true, mm -hmm. Joseph Smith's a prophet, the Book of Mormon's true, and yet you're on the other side doing things that you know you're not supposed yeah. to be doing. Yeah. How do we do, why do we do that? Is that I, just human nature? Is I that, think it is. You do know, we Mormons have a, or not we Mormons, but <laughs> Mormons have a kind of a corner on that. I felt like I did as a, yeah. as a Mormon that I was able to do that successfully. Yeah, I think so. I think that the church does create, especially to a, a kid. You know, I don't know what it's like to be a 35-year-old Mormon, but especially to me as a kid, they created a standard that just wasn't achievable. And so Very I had to, yeah. yeah. And you didn't consider yourself a bad sinner. I mean, you'd... We don't consider ourselves sinners as Mormons right. don't consider themselves exactly. as sinners. Not perfect. No. But I was but just a, a person who was sinning. Yeah. But that's exactly what it is. It's yeah. like that's not your identity. That's something separate from yourself. Right. As opposed to now knowing that that is unfortunately and but also wonderfully through the, the resurrection and redemption of Christ central to who I am. No, yeah. 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 Well, but as compartmentalizing, I guess we just hope that eventually we'll be able to get rid of the bad compartments yeah. and or move on with the good ones. The gap will be bridged and whatever can't pass from the bad area to the good through the filter will yeah. leave. But of course, that's not yeah. really how it works. Well, Sam, you've got such a great story and there are some really more interest or some more interesting things to share. Yeah. So I think we'll do another uh, little segment. Okay, so, that sounds anyway, good. Anyway, we'll see you next time on the X-Mormon Files.